Yo, welcome back to another episode of On The Spot Sports. I'm Jack, and I'm along with... Tyler from On The Spot Sports. And today, we have a very special guest. We have Andrew D'Agostini from the East Coast Hockey League, who played on the Wheeling Nailers, Toledo Walleye, and the Brampton Beast this season. So, Andrew, how are you? I'm good. I'm, uh, I'm recovering from all that travel in this quarantine. It's yeah. helped me manage it, that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. So, uh, good that you're doing good. Thank you for coming on the on the show. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Yeah, so uh, how's, uh, how's quarantine going for you since we're in these weird times? Like I said, you know, when, when you have such a crazy life in the winter, especially with trades and, and moving around from place to place and constantly on a bus and, and that sort of thing, um, it really made quarantine manageable for me. Uh, it's a, a huge change of pace, but like I said, life is so crazy that I was able to uh, just kind of, uh, I, I was okay marinating on the couch for a, a, a week or two, of course, doing, doing training, but just not having to go anywhere or that sort of thing, not having a huge uh, agenda and, and back and forth. It was really nice just to reset. Um, certainly needed that. I'm chomping at the bit a little bit now uh anxious to get hit by some pucks um you know as crazy as that, as that sounds for people who are, are not goalies uh you know you, you kind of miss that that uh that feeling of uh of just being on the ice and and uh every everything to do with the game really uh you, you do start to miss it pretty quick but i've managed quarantine okay i've i've been able to keep uh keep myself busy like uh, we talked about, I, I finished school, my master's degree, which was really a uh, nice, big relief. Um, other than that, you know, doing some, uh, doing some reading, playing some music. My house is filled with instruments, uh, something that I've always uh, enjoyed doing. And once you pick up one, it's easy to pick up others. So uh, you look around and you've got guitars, key- keyboard, drums everywhere. Uh, and, and that's helped me get through. And I'm not one to... Uh, to to binge on netflix but that's certainly been the case these past couple weeks with a a couple shows here that have got me hooked in that's why i I don't start because i know i'll get hooked and uh and i don't think i had been hooked on anything since like entourage back when i was in school and all of a sudden I've, i've watched three seasons of ozark and animal kingdom and all kinds of great shows that I'm getting started on and and sucked right in. So it's been good. It's been different, but, uh, you know, I'm managing. Okay. Yeah. You just got to take advantage of it. while while you can, you're not traveling. Yeah. It it, it won't last. Yeah. That's for sure. And I've, I've been chomping at the bit to get back, to get back on the ice. So I'd take my brother out to like my backyard and just have him shoot pucks on me. There you go. That's how how much I want to get shots on me. Yeah. It's weird as a goalie is that you want to actually get shots. It is very weird, and it's hard to understand sometimes, but um, it is. It's, it's that kind of uh, – it's that shot of dopamine that you get, that feeling of uh, accomplishment when you make a save is probably not uh, very much different than when someone scores. So uh, maybe only goalies can understand because I don't know how much uh, players like blocking shots, although they do do it for us sometimes. That is true, and that's, we're thankful for that. Yes, we are. Yeah, so uh, what what made you get into playing hockey? And, like, when did you start? How old were you? And who inspired you to play? Uh, I grew up in a hockey family. My my dad played um, not quite at the level that I did. He grew up playing um, – his his highest level was junior C in uh, in the area and uh, locally in, in Ontario. Uh, he had me on skates when I was two years old. Uh, so started skating at an early age, uh, started learning how to skate formally in a, a league when I was four as a player. Um, and uh, I, I think it's safe to say after doing so many interviews and always giving the same answer, I think I got to give credit to uh, to my uncle. Um, I have an uncle uh, here who was uh, an, an age where uh, he was still quite young uh, as an uncle to me and my, my three brothers that he loved playing road hockey with us or whenever we'd go and visit the, um, you know, them, he would have his 
and if so I should say he was a goalie, uh, we would go visit him and I would put on his gear and his glove and his helmet and his pads. And for some reason I was always drawn to that. Um, he was a very small athletic goalie, which ended up being the case for me. Um, and, and, you know, having watched him play and being able to put on his gear, I, I think that's kind of what gave me the first experience of, of playing goal. And, and you get drawn to making those flashy saves that, uh, you know, as a kid, you, you don't realize it's not always the way you want to play. Um, but uh, it, it's a lot of fun while you're, while you're young. And so uh, I played a few years as a player. Finally, I, I decided to make the transition when I was uh, seven, seven or eight years old. Um, we, we had that, you know, that thing where the, the house league team gives every player a chance to play goal. I played once and, uh, and it kind of stuck. I asked if I could play the rest of the year. Um, played the rest of the year with a road hockey glove. Um, and, and from there, I actually got, I, I still don't know why, uh, but there was a select, uh, a select coach that had watched me play and approached my dad and said, we, we need a goalie for in, in two weeks. Our goalie isn't going to be able to play in this game. And, you know, would your son want to come play? We watched him and, you know, he looks like he can hold his own. And at that point we, we didn't really have uh, proper equipment. Like I said, road hockey glove and God knows what pads I was wearing. So we actually borrowed equipment from my, uh, my brother's friend, my brother who's a couple years older and uh, he didn't even have full equipment for me. So I go into this select game with player, everything, including gloves uh, with exception to two pads. And we got absolutely smoked. Uh, it was not pretty. Um, I can still, it's, it's strange. And I talked about this on another podcast last week. It's, it's strange how you can remember specific plays from like almost 20 years ago. Um, I'm sure players can do the same, but you know, you can, you can remember specific goals you let in or saves you made or whatever. And, and I can still remember a couple of the goals that I, I gave up, um, in my first select game as a, as a goalie. So it's, it's, funny but uh after that experience i just i stuck with it i played uh, at a select level the uh the following year played one year there with my cousin and my uncle who was the coach uh, a different uncle than than the goalie that inspired me to play uh and then from then on i i jumped up uh, an age group playing for the same team so i was up a, up a year for a couple years and then I started to make my way through single A, double A, triple A, and all that, and all that stuff. Yeah. So it that, that's an awesome story, and uh, it's weird how goalies can remember like different like save scenarios. Like I can go back from like when I first started and like we point like stuff out, like how how goals went in, like the play that started the entire play. It's weird. It is. It's wild. It's wild. But, but, you know, it's, it's fun to be able to look back on that and, uh, and remember it. So. Yeah, exactly. So you were, uh, you were drafted in 2009, number 46 overall to the Peterborough peach and the OHL prior priority selection. So what was that experience like and how did like the draft process go for you? So, you know, going back to climbing through the ranks of, of double and triple A hockey, uh, I only played AAA for two years before getting drafted, so it was a bit of a late bloomer that way. Um, my, I was lucky to have uh, my dad, who, well, both my parents, for that matter, they're both superhuman, but my, um, my, my dad, who had the flexibility in work to be able to drive me here and there and, and all that sort of thing, just helped me keep my head on straight all year because as a late bloomer, you're always stressed out about the draft and thinking, these guys that were playing triple A since they were eight are going to get drafted and I'm not going to get drafted and that sort of thing. And just said, stick to the plan, just continue to work. People will notice. And sure enough, they did. I played well and, and was fortunate enough to get drafted draft day. Um, we've got a professional soccer uh, team here in Toronto called Toronto FC. <clears throat> and uh, I had tickets to go to a game in the afternoon with, with my brother the day of the draft and the day of the draft, uh, I think they were, they do 
the first three rounds on like a live stream on the computer. And the rest is like, you got to refresh your computer, refresh your computer, hope your name pops up. And, uh, and so we watched the first couple of rounds of the draft. And, and finally we're getting to that point where I got to start to make my way to this soccer game. And you know, my mom asks me if I have the tickets ready and do I know where the tickets are? And I'm like, Oh crap. I, I don't. So I go into my room too. And we've got in the living room, uh, the, the computer set up. I go into my room to look for these tickets and I hear my family screaming, calling my name, shouting. And I had known what had happened, but, uh, unfortunately I missed it. So I run in to see like my face on the screen for, you know, 30 seconds where they, you know, explained who I was, where I played all that sort of thing. And so I missed that specific moment when they called my name, but, uh, you know, I got a call from the coach right after that. And, uh, you know, they were really serious about me playing. I didn't know it at the time, but playing my 16 year old, uh, year there. And for two reasons, a, you know, I, I was capable enough to, to play, um, not to be a starter, uh, definitely not, but, uh, I had, I had that potential there, but that they knew that they were getting a mature 16 year old, uh, kid who wasn't going to cause any problems, who was just going to be a good teammate and work hard and that sort of thing. So I really believe that that was, uh, as equal, as equally important for me getting drafted as was how I did on the ice. Yeah, so you played your whole OHL eligibility there at P- in Petersboro, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, five yeah. years. Uh, five years how, how was that? It was awesome. We struggled for a few years, um, but having played there, I built some amazing relationships, uh, got really involved in the community. Uh, like I said, made lots of friends. I still see my billet. Um, <clears throat> my brother actually worked for the team for a couple of years. And, uh, when I moved, when I went to Guelph, he worked there for an extra few years and now he works with a different company, but, uh, is still very much involved in the community. And we actually own a property there in Peterborough now. It's only about an hour and 15 away. And so we are, uh, frequently back there for many different reasons. And so I, I grew very close to the community. So I'm thankful for that. And, uh, you know, Peterborough, the the Peterborough Pete's organization taught me about how important it was to be involved in the community, which is something that uh, is one of the best things that came out of my hockey career was that uh, how I developed as, as a leader in the community and my desire to, to give back and, and continue to do that. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm thankful for that as well, but from the, the playing front on the ice uh, you know, having, the opportunity to face a lot of shots when we struggled and to develop that way. Uh, it, it gave me the opportunity to play for team Canada at the under 18 championships and uh, play in the OHL subway series. I went on to a couple NHL camps and ultimately, ultimately it got me ready for uh, a successful couple years playing in the CIS in school. And then which led me to, to go pro. So that was the, the route I took. What was it like for you having that connection with the community? And you said being like a leader in the community. Uh, it's one of the most important things in, in my opinion, it, it really helped me keep my head on straight when, you know, you really are uh, a, a hot commodity and a popular figure in the community. It's easy as a 16 year old, 17 year old to lose your head. And I've seen lots of players do that, but um for that reason, keeping me grounded. And, uh, I, it's, it's hard to explain until you actually get involved and make an impact on someone, whether it's just for an afternoon doing a habitat for humanity or visiting a hospital or feeding the homeless, that sort of thing. The feeling, uh, I would, uh, equate it to, to winning a hockey game that, that, success feeling that that you have when you win you feel kind of on top of the world I get that same that same feeling when I I'm able to give back and I was able to start a you know a charity initiative for cystic fibrosis there in Peterborough which carried on to Guelph it now runs with the uh, Reading Royals and the Brampton Beast and so we've got it running for through four teams right now um, 
and I credit it all back to my exposure to that sort of thing in Peterborough. I think it's incredibly important. I actually, part of my thesis for my master's degree was on uh, players that started an initiative uh, at a level prior to professional. Um, and the reason I, I chose to study that was because I, I think in many cases, not all, and, and I do believe that the philanthropy from professionals is very pure and, and from the heart, uh, but it's super easy just to fork out 15 grand of their money and say, here, let's, can you guys set this up for me and I'll show up at the golf tournament and whatever. And it's the case for some. And uh, there's many self-serving benefits to that sort of thing. Whereas I found that, and in my, you know, my study proved that many of the, um, the motives behind athletes that started it at a younger age or a level before pro, they're a lot more organic and, and from the heart and uh, all usually stem from experiences like traumatic experiences that, that they had, whether it was losing a father or brother suffers from depression or some, you know, sister has cancer or that sort of thing. <clears throat> like I said, it's the case in pro too, but um, I just found it to be really uh, organic, the, the reasons behind those young athletes starting it. And so uh, I, I think that more athletes should be doing that and looking for something to, to get involved in. And uh, you experience some endless benefits from it. Yeah, being part of the community is just great. Like I've, I've done a few uh, community events and awesome. it, really, it really does. Like, it's a different kind of, uh, yeah. of feeling, but it's a good one for sure. Yeah, for sure. So what has been like your favorite part about uh, being in like the community game, I guess you could say? Like my involvement in the community? Yeah. <clears throat> um, like I said, endless benefits, but you know, there's, there's a certain kind of moment that usually happens that really helps you kind of step back and realize the impact you're having is when uh, a parent will reach out to me and say, my kid has cystic fibrosis and uh, you know, we struggle every day doing his treatments and uh, you know, we know these people and those people who, who died at an early age because of, because of this. And we just want to let you know that your efforts mean the world to us and uh, just basically showing thanks for my involvement. Um, that that's kind of when you you really it hits home and, and you realize how fortunate you are to get to do what you love for a living um <clears throat> i think maybe this is happening for a reason but for example having dealt with a four month long pneumonia this year um my and and trying to play the season through it because jobs are hard to keep in the echl uh, you know, my lung capacity went down only about 6% <clears throat> when I went to the hospital and, and, you know, they diagnosed and, uh, it's, it's something that a lot of people with CF deal with is a, a reduced lung capacity. Cause that's kind of where the disease is. Um, it targets and does damage the most. And so, when I got diagnosed and they said your lung capacity's dropped about six or seven percent, of course you can go and try to play and do your best, but I couldn't even get through a fifteen minute warm up on a, like a, a lung capacity down so little, whereas you've got people um, that have these types of of diseases where their lung capacity goes down to like twenty percent, fifteen percent. Mine was down to like ninety four ninety five and so that was another uh, way that it kind of just, it, it showed me how fortunate I was to be healthy and be able to play. And uh, whereas other people, you know, they're spending their summer in the hospital fighting for every breath. And, and that's cystic fibrosis specifically. There's endless number of different things that people go through, not just diseases, but mental illness and all kinds of stuff. And so, whatever resonates with you, I encourage you to go and, and try to make a, a difference for, for all of the reasons that I've just mentioned. 
Yeah, for sure. That that's awesome. Like everything that you've you were you've been doing with the community, it's just awesome to hear that and like it's just awesome. And it's not as hard as you think. It's it's really easy to to get involved and use your human resources, your mom, dad, friends. They'll know if you don't already know where to go to to get involved or or to start something of your own. Yeah, and it's also a good way to get your mind off of like hockey and like sports and just focus on like community. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was a, a one of the most popular answers in the the young athletes that I interviewed was that it uh it separated life from the game, which is very difficult for us to do at times. Um and I struggled with that especially my first couple of years <coughs> in uh, in Peterborough. I was like, they had to kick me out of the rink because I was, I was working. I would go home and I'd be on YouTube or I'd be reading or I'd be something and just like way overboard that I never let my mind rest. And to an extent, I still struggle that way. But, um, but being involved in the community really allowed me to, and school as well, allow me to balance life a, a little bit better. Um, and so that was a huge benefit of it. And, and ultimately it helped my playing on the ice. Yeah. So you, with Peterborough, you played 190 games. I counted for the, yeah. your entire five years. So that's a lot of hockey. It is. Um, like I said, we struggled for a few years. So a handful of those games were not full games. Um, whether it was, I was going in or I was coming out. But uh, it was a lot of hockey for one team, and, and that I don't think is including um, playoffs either, which we ended up, uh, you know, doing okay my my uh, overage year with Peterborough. Yeah, so your overage year, I I believe I saw that you played eleven playoff games. So like, what was that like experience like? Because playoff hockey is <clears throat> a lot different than regular season hockey. Yeah, it it really is, and I like I I touched on this last week talking to some other guys on a podcast and, and um, you know, we, we went into that my final year into the home opener in Peterborough in front of, you know, a, as close to a sold out crowd as you're going to get um, against the Kingston Frontenacs who had a good team. They had Sam Bennett at the time um, and we lost 11, uh, five. I can tell you I did not finish that game, uh, but they really took it to us. And then you go into playoffs and they go up three nothing in uh, in the series against us, and and we came back, and we were one of I think now four teams to come back from a three nothing deficit uh, in a playoff series. We won in Game Seven in Kingston in in overtime. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. What was what was that experience? What was that like feeling like like being <coughs> in, uh, in Game Seven? It uh, it was wild. You you know after. Because going into the game, you're thinking nothing about just playing hockey. That's kind of what helps you keep your head on straight. You just say, we've practiced how we're supposed to practice. We've prepared properly. Just go out and play. Whenever I do feel stressed out about, um, about a game, I'll just say, you know, I'm ready for it. I've done what I can. And whatever's going to happen is going to happen as long as I can go out there and, and do everything uh, possible to be successful. I can live with the outcome that was the case there I think the big mental test for us was being down three nothing and trying to convince ourselves that we still had a chance and the only way we could do that was by going uh, period by period game by game because if you think we got to win four games against a team that just beat us three times and are basically running our show um, you can only take that a, a shift in a period at a time and we chipped away at it and and did something that not a lot of teams do and so that was one of my, my fondest memories of, uh, of Peterborough and really my hockey career in general. Yeah, so that was going to be like leading into my next question was when you guys went down 3-0, did you have that like down but not out mentality? Or like what, what was your overall mentality when you went down? For a few of us, it was our overage year. So we thought that the more or if we win – our OHL career will continue on an extra game. And so that was kind of our inspiration. We didn't want it to end. Ultimately we were exhausted for the second round and got swept, but <clears throat> to go out with a bang like that in Peterborough, I think it really sparked 
the upcoming years for Peterborough to have some success. Um, down but not out, certainly winning one game gave us some hope, some momentum that ultimately helped us uh, into that uh, what would have been game uh, five and then six and seven. So uh, it was a combination of uh, just belief, taking that first step, chipping away at it, and getting some momentum that, that helped push us through game by game. Yeah, it's just like you just got to focus on that game and then just keep keep going from there. And it, and it should be the case. Uh, it should be the case all year. You should just – because if you think about a 68-game season, like you'd be tired just thinking about it, right? You can really only go game by game, and um, the outcomes will take care of, the, of themselves. Yeah, so in 2014, I believe it was, uh, you got in a goalie fight with uh, Daniel Altshuler. So, like, how was that, and, like, how did it start? Uh, Peterborough and Oshawa is probably one of the biggest rivalries in junior hockey. Um, obviously, I, 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 it's hard to have anything, unless you know him outside of the rink, it's hard to have anything personal against the guy at the other net. Um, and uh, And, you know, for me, that that didn't help the case because I went up to center ice smiling and it was in Peterborough. And so I was just kind of excited that it was happening and uh, it was maybe three or four weeks left in, uh, in the season. I had busted up my ankle, I was playing through a brutal uh, ankle injury that um, I ended up playing the playoffs um, with as well. But we just kind of, like, it was getting rough, and there were a couple line brawls, you know, as, as much as you can uh, call it that in, in today's game. You don't see a lot of them anymore. But two or three guys scrapping, I'm calling it a line brawl uh, in, in 2020 or, or whenever it happened. And so we just make that eye contact, and we start to do this gliding towards center ice. And finally, we both commit. We're like, okay, we're doing it on my way, I take off everything and I'm ready to go. And he uh, drops his stick and points at his mask because he knew what I didn't know was that taking off the mask alone is an extra suspension. I can't remember for a game or two games or whatever. And uh, as soon as he does this, I, I went like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> and when I did that, he took off his mask and grabbed me and caught me a, a bit off guard. And so I got a, a half decent grip on him enough to like still be up. Um, but what I didn't do wrong was what I did wrong was he was um, six foot four, six foot three, six foot four. <clears throat> and what I found out later was a third degree black belt. I'm still not sure if that's true or not, but he hit like it. He's a hard, hard hitter. Um, so I grab him and instead of, tucking myself in close I just kind of naturally pushed him away and turned my head so I didn't eat one right off the bat because he caught me off guard and um and so I've got him and all the noise and the craziness is a blur I I'm just like thinking in my head at that point we're in a fight and I'm just thinking in my head I'm gonna take one swing and it's gonna go really well or it's gonna go really bad and so sure enough, I turn and try to hit him and he's got me in a grip here and he deflects my arm up. I lose balance this way and then I lose balance forward. My jersey comes over my head. <clears throat> I, I'm still hanging on. We're kind of spinning around and he's hitting me on, on the head a few times. Um, nothing too crazy, but he's, he's getting some shots in and I'm just kind of spinning us and I'm like, I can't get my head through the sweater. And finally I just wrestle us both to the ground. The refs fall on top of us. And then I, I'm like, well, we did it. it. You know, I, I didn't win. I didn't get crushed or anything, but then I went and I was like, okay, I'm getting kicked out. I'm going to appreciate the, what the crowd is doing right now. And they were going bananas. So um, it was a, a fun experience. I haven't since um, I had one goalie challenge me um, in my very brief uh, stint in the SPHL and it was not worth my time. Um, and so that, that's it. Will it happen again? I don't know, but uh, I can say that I did it. 
Yeah, that, now, now you just got to score a goal. I know. I honestly, I haven't had the chance to even go for it. Um, although my, my rookie year in pro, uh, I was one of our leading point getters for uh, maybe a couple weeks. Super lucky, though. Like a couple of them, I think, were passes. But uh, I think two or three of them were like you make a save and then the guys just go down and score. But I had four points in uh, four points in 12 games. Not a point since. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it, it seemed like a very spirited bout, but like a Holpe, uh emery kind of fight there. When you- yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I did what I could, but I was outmatched size-wise, and I just I, – I knew once I got the jersey cut – maybe it would have been a different story, maybe not. Maybe it would have been worse, but I got the jersey cut over my head, and from that point on, I was like, if I don't get it, they pop it through, which it was just not going to happen. I was like, I got to wrestle us both to the ground. And so I, I tried my best to, to do that. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, in 2010, 2011, you played uh, in the World Juniors for uh, Team Canada. So what was that experience like? And what was uh, one thing that you learned? So <clears throat> it wasn't actually the, the World Juniors event. It was the under-18s. It was a tournament that they have uh, – after your, I guess, 17 year old year. So after what would be your second year in the OHL going into your draft year or no, sorry. After, after your draft year, um, which is your second year getting all mixed up here. Uh, so it was an opportunity for a couple things to be scouted for like a last chance, um, to be scouted for the NHL draft. Um, and also for Hockey Canada and probably the other countries as well to assess, to select a, a team for the World Juniors. And so uh, that experience, it was amazing. It was my first time getting to go overseas, played with a lot of really good players. I roomed with Morgan Riley, which was, uh, which was awesome. Uh, Malcolm Subban was my partner and we had a pretty star-studded lineup, but so did the other countries. So um, we had a close battle with John Gibson and Team USA in the semifinals. And then we ended up, so we lost, I think, 5-4 to Team USA. And then we got the early game the next day against Team Russia. And we lost in the bronze medal game. So uh, we had a, a pretty good tournament, I think. Um, I think we underachieved. Uh, you know, if if that game that I think it was overtime, if that game goes different against Team USA, maybe we win the tournament, and then you know the other way is is fourth place. So um, I got so much out of that experience, though, and and I'm thankful that I was selected. Um, what did I what did I learn out of the experience? I think it was my first chance to uh, experience a a very foreign part of the world. And it kind of just opened my eyes to the opportunities you really can get out of your hockey career and to take advantage of of them. And so that mentality um, kind of helped me uh, decide to take an opportunity to go to Australia for this like Canada, US uh, series thing that I went to was one of the best experiences of my life. And, and also when you're traveling around small towns in, in the U S that you would never otherwise go to, um, you know, some big cities, well-known places, but some small towns too, just to, um, kind of observe and see what the lifestyle is like and to appreciate different parts of the world. Uh, and, and so not hockey related, but, uh, but, something that I am thankful for that experience. Um, anytime you get to play with, with players like that though, um, whether it's playing for team Canada or going to an NHL camp, or, you know, if you're a 16 year old doing summer training with NHL guys, just being in the presence of, of great players who are disciplined and focused and, uh, either playing where you want to be, or, you know, they're going to play there. It's a great opportunity to just kind of uh, 
of uh, see what that's all about and how they handle themselves. And there's always things you can take away from, from that. There's always things you can learn from, from others and apply it where you think it might help you. Yeah, for sure. So um, what, what was that experience like playing uh, overseas and like, what, uh, what was the time change like uh, when you first got there? Time change. I, yikes. Uh, I think maybe six or eight hours. I might be way off. Hopefully I'm not. I think it was like six or eight hours. Um, and, uh, jet lag, I don't remember being a huge issue when I went to Australia. I struggled, uh, going there and even worse coming back because they, <clears throat> they told us stay up all night. So we, we played our last game. Uh, they said, stay up all night, sleep the morning into the afternoon uh, when you're on the plane. And so I stayed up all night. I was so tired that I couldn't sleep on the plane. So it was up for like 48 hours I'd fly into LA and then have like a, a five hour flight home that they said, stay up on now so that you'll sleep that night. Uh, and that's where I slept for like two hours. So that threw me for a loop, but, uh, going to Germany, they, uh, did everything they could actually, it's a, a common theme. I, I had this brutal throat um, throat thing going on that started on the plane there. And so jet lag wasn't really, now that I think about it, it wasn't a huge issue as much as this like thing I had, whether it was strep or meningitis or something, but it, it ruined me for like five days, six days. And we ate a lot of, uh, a lot of bread and, things like that they had for breakfast. So breakfast was always brutal. It was like scraping down a throat that's already like you can't swallow anything. Yeah. Um, so that was my issue with the travel. Um, but other than that, when you're with like Team Canada, they're doing everything they can to make sure you are um, fully ready to go and and um in any way possible whether it's supplements food travel rest hotels all that kind of stuff um <clears throat> there's a level of uh, professionalism that canada holds to a high standard as i'm sure team usa does the same and um and so uh you know i handled everything just fine with exception to a brutal throat illness let's call it yeah, so or did you have to play through the throat? Uh, yeah, yeah. You and honestly, you look back and and there's there's times where I'll look back and say I shouldn't have played through that. I should have rested it and whatever. But then there's times where I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm glad I played through that because it paid off in other times. Like the year we won the championship. Um, this is going to be a, a interesting story, but <clears throat> the year we won the championship with Guelph, I had, we were going into playoffs like game one, my rookie year. And uh, we had to drive three, three and a half hours to Windsor, Ontario, just at the border of uh, Detroit there. Uh, and the night before the game, I had a bad lunch on campus at about 6 PM. I'm in bed. Um, basically like, I feel like I'm dying. I'm sick as hell. Didn't sleep all night. I'm sure you can imagine what was going on in the bathroom. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and the next day I, uh, I go to my coach's office when we're getting ready to <clears throat> jump on the bus and go. And I'm planning on telling him, I don't know if I can go and play. Um, I show up in there and I had previously gone to Detroit Red Wings development camp and their player development, uh, guy, Yuri Fisher was in there and I was like, Oh no, I can't say anything now. But what gave me the strength to end up going and, and playing and ultimately winning the game was having played through brutal circumstances previously and knowing that I could get through it and just having that mental will to, to play through it. 
So we're traveling on this bus. It was a miracle. We didn't have to pull it over for you know what reason. I get there, zero warm up for the game. I'm in the men's restroom and my team is warming up, getting ready. I get ready just in time. It was a game where I very much relied on positioning. I was deep in my crease, didn't feel like moving, <clears throat> but managed to have a decent game. Uh, but you play through some injuries, you play through some illness that helps you down the road. For example, like this, this past season, I don't know if it was a good idea for me to try and grind out through a pneumonia, um, but I was able to, uh, whereas lots of other people probably wouldn't. But for the sake of keeping a job, I felt like that's what I needed to do as a free agent goalie, grinding it out in the coast, like uh, financially it was not worth it, but for the love of the game and for go chasing after your dreams and, and trying to fight for some opportunities, I felt like I needed to play through it and keep it as quiet as possible. And um, it was past experiences of playing through injuries and, and that sort of thing uh, that allowed me to do so where I don't think you should play through and I've done multiple times and uh, you know I, I look back and and see the effects and it scares you <clears throat> is playing through concussions that is an absolute I would not you know tell anyone to to do that and you know if you do have a head injury that's something that you you tell people about and if the coach wants to think you're faking it for whatever reason who cares it's your mental well-being um you know, as, as soon as you start to see like short-term memory loss and things like that, you don't care what other people think. If, if you want to get cut because they thought you were faking it, sure. And maybe in some cases people do for whatever reason. But if you know you have a head injury, you get that thing better before putting yourself in jeopardy. I did a number of times, again, just that stubborn like will to play through anything. Um, I've played through concussion a few times. <clears throat> And then they come back easier. It does. It's not hard to get a second, third, fourth concussion. Um, and uh, and where I do think kind of things align and come full circle is I'm thankful for having continued education for the sake of my health and kind of battling the symptoms of concussions and keeping my brain healthy and sharp and that sort of thing. Um, so I think things happen for a reason and, and I think that was the case there. And so I, I'm thankfully I'm, you know, I'm as healthy as I can be uh, upstairs, but that's where I, I regret kind of playing through something that I probably shouldn't have played through. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Don't, I haven't had any of those types of injuries, knock on wood, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I played through a broken pinky finger and like I couldn't even hold on to my stick. I had to hold on with like these three fingers, and it was yeah, just, it was awful. Because I took a shot from, I'd make a desperation save on the other side of the net, so I like put my blocker hand like, like where the hand open, and yeah. got it right there, and start, it hurt so bad. But I, yeah. I couldn't do it. Yeah, you just learned to tough it out, right? I uh, <laughs> I dislocated my finger once. You can kind of you can kind of see here that it's in this shape now uh playing sewer ball before a game so mm. dumb i went to do like an exaggerated head header of the ball and uh kind of fall back and plant my finger on my neighbor's running shoe and i could feel like the finger go out all the way this way and mm. i just close it when it happened and i was like i'm gonna open up my finger and it's gonna be hanging like um Thankfully, it wasn't, but I, I dumb it really good. Glove hand too, um, and so I, I paid the price for that. But again, it's just one of those things that not a lot of people knew that I was dealing with it, and you learn to just deal with it, as miserable as it was. Yeah, I, I also, I also chipped some teeth uh, from a from from a shot too. So, mm -hmm. so there's always those uh, types of stories as well. No kidding. Yeah. This happened. Uh, I lost one here this year. These two slap shot a couple of years ago. 
<clears throat> this one I was happy about because it, it forced the team to get me a new mask. Needed uh, one. Um, <laughs> and, but this one was like, shouldn't have happened. Guy came in and took a slap shot in a morning skate. Um, way too close to the net and just it it got me at the perfect spot but it it just let like you know the impact I think I blacked out so it didn't really bother me that way it was like the five procedures after and then a year later both of my teeth uh died and needed root canals a week apart and so it just like it was a hassle for a year um but on the bright side my teeth were like this. Now they're straight. So oh, that's a good sign. Yeah. I said, knock out my bottom teeth now and straighten those up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, what was that experience like playing with the uh, University of Golf? And uh, like what made you decide to play uh, juniors and then go into uh, playing U sport? Um, realistically, if I had the opportunity to just go pro, I would have. <clears throat> and then maybe – uh, pursued school like on a part-time basis but uh, it, it wasn't the reality for me unfortunately uh, I had a lot of interest from a lot of different teams and so there were um, besides the hockey program being as reputable as could be uh, two things they needed to uh, be on board with running my uh, charity program for cystic fibrosis which no team had an issue and then secondly and this kind of put me over the edge with between them and a couple others was I wanted that university experience with like a great um, a nice size campus uh, one that would I would enjoy walking through it was it, Guelph has a, a beautiful campus um, uh, uh, a great area that it's in um, and I just knew that I would enjoy the culture and the my school experience while I was there. Uh, my goal was to go and uh, get through school as quickly as possible, but make the most of the experience. So I, I went there for two years. I did full-time summer school, like three or four courses in between each of those summers. And, uh, and then went on to, to pro, but I, you know, I, I, when I played in Brampton, my rookie year it was really close to Guelph and I still had obviously a lot of friends and teammates that still went to school there. And, and so, uh, I was able to go back there and almost as if I was there for a third year. And, uh, it's funny how things line up, but Guelph was amazing. I loved my experience there and, uh, and, and ultimately it led to my master's degree out of Guelph. Yeah, so your first year you went 10 and 9, and then your second year you went 14 and 9, 23 games. So, yeah. what was the, uh, why, why do you think your, uh, your play got a lot better and you got more uh, wins during that second season? And, like, what was the difference between, like, tra- tra- uh, going from the OHL to uh, college? Uh, it was an interesting transition because uh, Guelph's rink is a, an Olympic size ice. <clears throat> Uh, I think just it, our team was, uh, and funny enough, the 10 and nine year, um, the 10 and nine year was our championship year. The year we won, we had a good year, the, the, the following year, uh, but we just, we, we couldn't pull through in the, I can't remember what series it was second or third series. I think we won two rounds and then lost in the third round. It's a bit of a different, uh, playoff kind of bracket uh but I had a great season my second year my first year we were last place in almost in in Canada in all of you sports with exception to like one or two teams that are always kind of at that bottom end and it was another thing very much like that series in Kingston where we just caught some momentum went on a tear enough to sneak us into the playoffs. And again, this is proof, if nothing else, that it's a weird bracket is uh, we, we finished in sixth or seventh and snuck in the playoffs and ended up hosting the championship game. How that works, I still can't explain it. But that was to our advantage because had we gone to UQTR, which is a, a team in Quebec, 
I'm not a pessimist, but we would have had a very tough time getting uh, past the the one sided refing that we experienced earlier that season in uh, in Quebec in, on with that team specifically. It's it's just the way it is. So we were fortunate to to host that game, <clears throat> and it went really well for us. Um, so sometimes it doesn't matter what your season is like. It's just that momentum you have going into the playoffs, you just kind of need to get in there and then see what happens. And that's, that was the case. Yeah. The, or Tyler, you can go. Oh um, yeah. How did it feel for you winning that championship? It was amazing. I had, you know, lots of family there cause it was close. <clears throat> I had never won a championship before. Um, we had a packed, packed arena home. I, you know, we, we beat them for nothing. So it was a clean sheet. Um, so it was one of those days where you kind of feel on top of the world as, as much as you can winning the uh, Ontario University Championship. Um, you know, it's not quite the Stanley Cup, but you still go through a, a big physical grind and uh, you have to get by good teams uh, to, to win it. And so we were proud of ourselves and, you know, we got to have lots and lots of fun after that in a great party town. Um, and so it was, it was a, a night to feel, uh, very proud of ourselves as a team for overcoming a lot of adversity that year. And, and for me personally to just experience winning a championship, which I, I haven't, I hadn't done until then. And, uh, I haven't done since. So, uh, we went on to the national championships in Nova Scotia um, and we won the bronze medal there. And and once you're getting against like the East teams in the uh, Western Canadian universities, you're going up against some very good teams that can compete with um, U.S. college teams and maybe even uh, lower level coast teams. Uh and so we had a rough time with, uh, with one team in particular, which that would have been, I think, the semifinal game. And, and that pushed us into the bronze medal game against that same UQTR team that we beat uh, to win the Ontario Championships, and we beat them again, again there. So uh, it, it was a great year all around. Yeah, just, just the momentum it could change – dramatically and like like the blues for like last last year like they were last place and look where they went then during the playoffs when they caught the momentum it was a a year very very similar um and uh, i couldn't be happier for jordan bennington who i grew up playing against i think he was he might have been the first like goalie drafted right before me um we were close and we played against each other in, um, you know, in triple a and then throughout juniors as well. And he's a stud. He's unbelievable. And it shows, and he deserves it again. That's the story of a guy that overcame a lot of uh, adversity. Uh, physically, I, I don't know, but, but definitely mentally having uh, been kind of back and forth in the system and uh, being able to be ready to go when that opportunity presented itself and you can't question what he's done. So super cool for him. Yeah. I, I had the pleasure of watching Bennington for three years in Chicago for the Wolves and yeah, exactly. And I was, he played against the Wolves like the day before he got called up. So I saw him, I, I was talking to him for a little bit and then he got called up. So, and stick there ever since. So it was good for him. Yeah, yeah, and and so you've you've talked to him. You know he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, would you say that the that championship was one of your best moments of your uh, hockey career so far? Absolutely. Yeah, I would uh, I would put that in the same category as uh, you know our, our my overage year with with Peterborough and representing Team Canada. Um, I've had some great experiences playing pro as well, but. <clears throat> Winning a championship is always going to be up there. You you bond well with your uh, your teammates when you go on a run like that. And and when you're playing pro, you you have a lot of guys that are uh, 
you have some guys that are married. You have some guys, you just, you have players with different agendas. We travel a lot. So we do get to bond that way. Um, but there's something different about uh, when you're in college and you go from practice to class with them and then you're living with some of them and then you're spending uh, exam season, you're spending hours and hours and hours in the library with them. It's just a, a different kind of bond you, you build with those guys. And so um, I'll always be able to look back and say we're a really tight group of uh, players and we ended up you know, doing something special with our year. Yeah, so after that second year of uh, playing at University of Golf, you uh, went on to sign with the uh, Brampton Beast, and you got in, got to play uh, two games with them. So, like, what was that like experience like playing like two games right out right out of uh, college? The funny thing is, it it wasn't right out, like it technically was right out of college, but we finished our season and we were into uh, exams, and I hadn't really skated in like two weeks before I got called up and so I get called up and uh, I joined the goalie coach for um, I think were they shared affiliate at the time Um, either way we had like an American League NHL goalie coach down with us and I jump on the ice after the Brampton Beast Scout who kind of watched all the school the university teams and would recruit to like the way it would work was they'd start to pull players out of college, give you a chance to show yourself. <clears throat> and if you do, it could lead to a contract for the next year. And so he was convinced I could play. Uh, Greg Pelche is, uh, is his name. And he, he brought me to a game and he finally, he brought me down to, uh, to the coach's office said, bring him to practice and give him a chance. And so the coach uh, Colin ended up, you know, inviting me to practice and signing me and saying, I, I don't know, we're going to try and get you in. And uh, I show up at practice and we do some goalie drills. I hadn't skated in two weeks and I was absolutely brutal. I could see the look on some of their, the players' faces like, who the hell is this guy? Like, what is going on here? And, you know, for a goalie, you know, it doesn't take that long to get back into it. And by the end of the practice, I'd caught stride and, <clears throat> but God, I was bad in that first drill. Um, they throw me into my first game and uh, I win. And I i can't remember if I was first star or third star or something. Just, I, I had a really good game and that got me another game. Exact same thing. Um, we win. We, we didn't have a good – Brampton wasn't a great team that year. I think I was their 15th or 16th record-breaking goalie. Like – playing on their roster uh and i think player wise they had upwards of like 70 players on that roster like look on the hockey db and see the crazy list of players from that year so it was just a crazy year where uh i was really fortunate that um that the scout was vouching for me and colin chalk my coach gave me a couple opportunities to play get my foot in the door for pro and uh and you know have have strung together a a handful of years of pro now yeah and then uh you you uh signed with Brampton for two more years after that first like first two games right right you uh you signed uh two years with Brampton yeah that year so like you were with Brampton for another two years so like how did you like transition from like that from college like playing pro (laughs) was a pretty easy transition because Brampton is kind of exactly between Guelph where I went to school and Scarborough, which is home for me. And so I had a place in Brampton my first year, but I could stay at home when I wanted to, and I could stay in Guelph when I wanted to. Um, it was good that way because there, I had a, a class to finish my degree. I had a class that I had to be at in Guelph and I could go. Um, and the schedule worked out so that I could be there. So I was lucky that way. It made the transition to pro a lot uh, easier. I had some experience with the crappy bus trips uh, in in the OHL, but they're not even close to what you get in in the ECHL. So that was a shock for maybe the first month, maybe two months. You get adjusted, uh, and then you get used to it. You get used to like the travel. You get used to driving all night and practicing in the morning or 
whatever, you name it, it's happened. Um, and so ad adjusting to pro wasn't overly difficult. I had a good first year of, uh, of pro and uh, experienced uh, being called up to the American league. I haven't played, uh, I haven't played yet, but <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I backed up for the Marlies. And so that was an amazing experience of getting probably as close a taste to the NHL as, as I ever had um, because of, of how they uh, do business there with, with the Marlies, a great organization. Um, yeah, not a, not a tough transition for me. I was fortunate though, because for some people it, it can be a shock. I think I would have handled it fine. Uh, having had to mature quick, uh, in, in Peterborough. And so, uh, it, it's made the past few years, not overly difficult with all the back and forth kind of stuff you have from jumping on team to team. Yeah. I'm the hardest sorry. thing is remembering names. Yeah. when yeah, you've got can, like 80 imagine. players in a year yeah that definitely will get hard yeah yeah so uh you went down to the sphl for a little bit there and play with the pensacola ice flyers and the Macon mayhem so when you got what was like your mindset when you got <clears throat> when you got assigned to like the sphl after playing two full seasons in the in the echl um i had a very like i went to camp with Allen americans that year <clears throat> and had a really good camp, played an exhibition game and uh, thought I did what was necess necessary to make the team. Um, they saw it different. They kept the guy that was there the year before and uh, and sent me to Pensacola. My, I'd always told myself I just didn't have an interest in, in playing in the SPHL, nothing against the league. I just, you know, I've got my master's degree and I've, you know, I, I feel like my capabilities belong in at least the ECHL, but figured I'd go to stay on the ice and experience living in Florida for a month and uh, just go there and work my butt off and try to get back up as fast as I could. So I made, again, going back to what Germany taught me in Australia and I went, experienced a different way of living. Um, you know, you're shark fishing. You could cast a line from where we live. Pens playing in Pensacola was, uh, was amazing when it came to, you know, the, the living conditions. We were right on the beach. Um, and, uh, and that was great. Uh, I kept focused. I, I continued to work as hard as possible. Our team had a struggling start of the, of the season. And uh, I think... Pensacola usually is a successful team and uh, I think m most of the organization didn't really know how to handle not winning every game we weren't losing every game but we weren't winning every game uh, and uh, it it led to me being released uh, you know the the coach thought that maybe I was a, a big part of uh, our lack of success I obviously beg to differ. Um, but, uh, when you're there, you're, when, when you're playing in that league, a lot of players are hungry to get back up to ECHL if they've been sent down <clears throat> or, uh, they want their crack at the ECHL. For me, it was a hunger to get back and, uh, and, and it can suck for some of the organizations to lose all their players to ECHL call-ups. And that was the uh, the case with with many of the teams and so um they uh they ended up releasing me uh i think just like my my work ethic and and that sort of thing didn't it, it just didn't gel well with how things operate there uh that's how i felt anyways a lot of great guys i love my time like living with guys and doing the fishing thing and being on the beach and all that sort of stuff um uh, but I was lucky. I got, I got called up. Um, and, and I got called up and played games against, uh, the Allen Americans, uh, played a three and three, three games in, in three nights. And that was kind of my way to get back into the league. And, uh, all, all the games went well. Uh, and, uh, and sure enough, I kind of solidified my spot back there, uh, in, in the coast and, told myself I wouldn't get sent down again. And if I did, I, I probably wouldn't go.
Yeah. So uh, living in Florida must have been really nice. Uh, uh, li- living in Florida was awesome. Uh, like I said, shark fishing. You're on a boat the rest, like you're on the beach for the rest of the day after practice, and uh, the weather was was good still, and I was lucky. Uh, I was lucky for that. So I wasn't there long, but made the most of it. Yeah. So that next year you went. So the last season, I guess you could say now, you play with all Wheeling, Toledo, and uh, you went back to the Beast. So like, what was that season like? Traveling from like traveling from like city to city. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but we've got a neighbor who is like sawing the crap out of something right now. So yeah. sorry if you guys are catching that. No, it's all good. I'm trying to like talk over it. Um, <clears throat> it was a, a year of a, a, a like a ton of travel personally. So like on top of like the team's travel, it was like, I, I think I counted 11 days of, uh, of me driving on my own from like place to place, whether it was, um, it's distracting me now. Um, whether it was uh, home, I went to camp with Wilkes, uh, Pittsburgh's farm team, to Wheeling, home, back to Wheeling, back home when I got my pneumonia, picked up by Toledo, Toledo traded to Wheeling, and back home to Brampton. So it was like an exhausting year, and, and we go uh, back to why I'm handling quarantine just fine right now is for that reason. Um, Didn't get a ton of games this year. Uh, I'm okay with that because I fought through pneumonia all year. Um, I'm not satisfied with with this season. Uh, But, you know, I I went through a lot of crap with this this illness and uh, still managed to get some games with Brampton uh, down the final stretch. And then sure enough, season's canceled as I'm starting to play a little bit more. But... uh, I don't know what's in store next uh, for next season, but uh, we'll see. I don't think many leagues know what's in store. Yeah, that is, it's a weird time. So, like, a lot of different leagues are have no idea, and everything's up in the air at this moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, you must put a lot of mileage on your uh, on your car throughout those uh, travels. Travel. My time. I got a Jeep Wrangler from 2012. I think my third third or fourth year in the OHL and it's been it's been good to me it's it's starting to have its moments now but we've spent a lot of time together traveling all over um <clears throat> it actually ended up making its way to Pensacola as well and through Macon and to Reading and so it's been just about everywhere um you you just learn to kind of like I said you roll with the punches and go wherever your career takes you uh, at the end of the day, you just control the things that you can control. And then there's a lot of other things that there's no sense in stressing about. I've learned that because I used to stress about them. Um, why is this happening? Why is that happening? At the end of the day, I just tell myself to shut up and work hard, right? Uh, uh, that's that's what I have control over and let the rest take care of itself. Yeah, you just got to control the controllables and that's about it pretty much. And just work on, just keep working hard. Exactly, exactly. It goes for you guys too. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Tyler, do you have any last minute questions? Uh, yeah, I think there, you talked about this at the beginning of the episode, Andrew, about uh, how some of your family members started you up. How important was it for you to have family members as role models and people to like guide you uh, to in the beginning of your hockey career? Uh, I'm fortunate. It was incredibly important. I know we got, I think we got less than a minute here. Um, without my parents, my career would not be where it is today. Uh, without, you know, my uncle as my inspiration to play goal. Um, I wouldn't have strapped on the pads and, and had the, the career that I, I have so far. And uh, I think it's incredibly important. Not everyone has that outlet. And uh, so for those that don't have that support, you, you, you could be there for them as a teammate. I think that would be a good message. Yeah, that that that's awesome. That's an awesome way to end this. So, Andrew, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate your time. And if you're ever uh, playing like in the Illinois area, we'll definitely try to get out to a game. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, good luck. In, uh, good luck next season, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Yeah.